Good evening, blessings and streetlight. How are we? Well, it was mediocre. Greg, you had a better response this morning. Uh, welcome to all to our service tonight, our joint service uh, with Streetlight. Uh, a special thanks to Paul for being willing to preach tonight. I would like to take this opportunity to let everyone know that we have ushers in the building. They're wearing blue lanyards. If, uh, if you have any questions or um, are looking for information, you can talk to them. You can also fill out a welcome card that's in the back of the chairs. Uh, you can fill that out or email uh, for information at info at blessingshamilton.ca. After the service, there will be prayer team members, both male and female, standing by the purple banner here. If there is something on your heart, that you'd like to pray for or pray with someone, please make use of that. Can I ask everyone to stand for the call to worship? Great and marvelous are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you, O Lord, are holy. All nations will come and worship you. Let's open with, give us clean hands. Let us lift up our hearts. The story of Jesus' death and resurrection is the turning point in history that begins with God's creation of the world and ends with God's transformation when Jesus returns. The Apostles' Creed expresses essential biblical doctrines 
that have been articulated, defended, and embraced for almost 2,000 years. Many Christians throughout history have used the Apostles' Creed as a personal statement of their faith. It puts Jesus' death and resurrection right at the center of our lives. When we recite the Apostles' Creed together, it reminds us that we live our lives as Christians within the story of God's salvation. Let us recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so thankful that we could come together again this evening with the understanding that we still need to be taught about how to live for you. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds to your word so that we can understand how important it is for us to come before you clean and how we can come before you clean. Will you be with Pastor Paul as he teaches us, Lord? Will you give him everything that he stands in need of? All this we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ's blood alone. Amen. I think that's all you, Pastor Paul. Thank you for the privilege of being able to bring the gospel this evening. I would like to read with you Lord's Day 26. It is our confessional reading. Matt, there's no special details here. I just read it, correct? Okay. I won't sing it then. Lord's Day 26, uh, so, yeah, Lord's Day 26 um, it teaches us about baptism. Uh, there are two Lord's Days about baptism, and I'm just reading the first. How does holy baptism signify and seal to you that the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross benefits you? In this way, Christ instituted this outward washing, and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away the dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away all the impurity of my soul, that is, all my sins. What does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? To be washed with Christ's blood means to receive forgiveness of sins from God through grace because of Christ's blood poured out for us by his sacrifice on the cross. To be washed with his spirit means to be renewed by the Holy Spirit and sanctified to be members of Christ so that more and more we become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. Where has Christ promised that he will wash us with his blood and spirit as surely as we are washed with the water of baptism? In the institution of baptism, where he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
Matthew 28, 19. Further, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. This promise is repeated where baptism calls baptism the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins. That's from Titus 3, 5 and Acts 22, 16. That is our confessional reading. In order that we may uh, ground the message in Scripture from the Bible, I would like to read a few verses from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verse 40 to the end of the chapter, where we read a very beautiful incident in the ministry of Jesus. So this is Mark chapter 1, therefore it is a, an event very early in his public ministry. There we read, a man with leprosy came to him, Jesus, and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet, the people still came to him from everywhere. The uh, title for the message this evening is, You Need to Wash Before You Can Come In. My mama was a fierce defender of the cleanliness of her home. Before you could come into the house, she was standing guard at the back door. Take off your boots and make sure you remove your shoes. And uh, go straight to the tap and wash your hands. And um, that, was, that was an important um, thing for my mom. Uh, because we lived on a chicken farm. And she wanted to make sure we weren't trampling manure into the house. She was very vigilant about this. My father, that is my father in heaven, my father in heaven is just as vigilant as you could, if you could imagine that, or if I could imagine that. As a matter of fact, he's more vigilant. He will not have us tramping dirt into his kingdom and into his holy presence, the the prophets, especially in the Old Testament, taught this repeatedly. I think, for instance, of Leviticus chapter 16, where you have a, a ceremony described. It's called the Day of Atonement. And it was a day that was devoted to scrubbing the sanctuary completely clean from every speck of impurity and every stain of dirt. Of course, it was especially pointing toward the removal of any filth, any spiritual filth. That was um, Leviticus chapter 16. The sanctuary of God had to be cleansed and kept clean. I think of Isaiah chapter 6 as well, where we are taught something similar there you have the angels of God standing around the, the, the throne of God. This is something that Isaiah is granted to see by a vision. And he sees the angels, and they're, they're almost fierce in their defense of the purity and spotlessness of God. And they're singing a song, and they're singing with such passion and such vigor that the doorposts and the and the, the, the door sill of the entrance into the presence of God or into, the, into heaven 
is, is quaking with the sound of their singing. And what they're singing is, is this famous song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, is Yahweh God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. And Habakkuk, he also uh, accentuates this teaching that the purity of God is so incredibly important. He's the one that says famously, this is what Habakkuk remains fa famous for. He says in his, one of his opening verses in verse 3, he says, the eyes of God are too pure to behold anything unclean. The opening miracle described in person in the gospel according to Mark draws attention to this matter. We read about a man who came into the, to Jesus who suffered leprosy. He was suffering from just an awful disease. Leprosy was the type of disease that made a person die on the outside. Leprosy is a disease that, um, which attacked the nervous and the blood supply system so that the extremities of the body, like the fingertips and, and the toes, and a person's nose and his ears, his elbows, these extremities of the body, they would, they would lose their feeling and they would lose their blood supply, so they would lose nourishment. Consequently, those parts of the body began to die. And decompose. It was a terrible, terrible disease. A person dying on the outside. It was almost impossible, they say, to tolerate the presence of a, leprous, of a person suffering from leprosy whose disease was somewhat advanced. It was almost impossible to tolerate them to be anywhere near you because of the horrible smell that came off of them. This disease graphically demonstrated in an outward fashion the inward condition that we all suffer from. Because Jesus himself says it's from inside that these horrible, putrid things are residing. It's inside that we have sinful thoughts that, that are just so intolerable to a holy person like God. Now this poor man, he, he came to Jesus and he says, if you can, you can make me clean. And it, it, it's important for us to note that he doesn't ask Jesus, if you can, you can, you can heal me. What this man wanted was not healing. Of course, he would love to be healed. But the word he chooses is, expresses what is on his heart. What he wants is to be made clean. Because his uncleanness, his disease rendered him unfit for the heavenly community and the earthly community. He wanted to be, he wanted to be cleansed. Now, to be clean, to be, to be made clean didn't mean in that culture and in that religious context of ancient Israel... In that context, to be made clean didn't mean to, to experience something hygienic. It was religious language 
it, it was a, what a person needed to be in order to enter into the, the presence of God. You have to be clean to come before him. And there were certain things almost inevitable, in fact, definitely inevitable in daily, in, in simple human life that, that made a person from time to time unclean. If you went to a funeral and you came near a dead body, or touched a dead body, you became unclean. If a, if a woman had a baby, she became unclean. If you, if you got a skin disease... Like leprosy, you became unclean. And somebody unclean lost the privilege of coming into the presence of God. You could not go to the temple. You could not do what we're doing right now. You could not be part of a, a worshiping community. You lost that privilege. You couldn't offer a gift to God at his altar. And you could not receive a blessing from the priest. This man who comes to Jesus, he, he had been unclean as for as long as he had this disease. And what he missed most was not his health, as bad as that was. What he missed was his God. And that's why he comes to Jesus and he says, if you, want, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And note too, he, he says to Jesus, if you are willing. This man has come to know about Jesus' reputation. Um, already early in, earlier on in this chapter, we have, in chapter 1, he, we have instances described. We're not instances, but in general, Mark tells us Jesus healed many people of all their diseases, and he cast out their demons, and he healed their sick. Jesus had very quickly developed a reputation for being a very powerful administrator of the, of the healing power of God, restoring people in various ways. And so he knew that Jesus had the power to heal him. He trusted and he believed in that. But what he doesn't know right now is if Jesus was willing. I know you can, but I don't know if you care, he says. It's the kind of question, is if you are willing, you can cleanse me. It's the kind of question that a person asks who has suffered too much rejection. God has rejected him. Society rejects him. Jesus, will you reject me too? I know you can, he says. But do you care? Mark 141, filled with compassion, as Jesus' response, he's filled with compassion for this man. The Greek language has beautiful ways of expressing emotion, and, and this word compassion, uh, it's, a, it's a really um, physi physiological way of describing an emotion. It's like his guts are twisting inside him as he looks upon this man and feels so much, so much pity for him. And then Jesus did something nobody had done for this man for a very long time. He reaches out and he touches him. He touches him. And he says, I am. Be clean. And then the man is healed. He is healed because Jesus put his hand on him. And by putting his hand on him, the law says Jesus now joins him in his uncleanness. I'm so surprised when I read the commentaries, all of them, 
without fail, all of them say, well, Jesus doesn't become unclean when he touches the leper because, because he's God. He's, he's, the, he's the holy one. But, but Jesus does not get any privilege that is not accessible to us. Any other person who touches an unclean person like a leper becomes by that fact unclean. And Jesus, by touching that man, becomes unclean. There's a transfer which takes place. As happens every time that Jesus heals somebody, every healing that Jesus performs and every cleansing that he accomplishes, and every demon that he possesses, that he, that he casts out, is a transfer from the person to Jesus. Jesus takes on that disease. Jesus takes on that demon. Jesus takes on that uncleanness. Matthew in order to make sure that we understand this, he, he's, he writes immediately after, in the very next paragraph, after he describes the cleansing of this, of this leper, Matthew tells us that he took our diseases and carried our sorrows. And that's what he does for this leper, for this man. <clears throat> he takes on his uncleanness. He takes on his leprosy. So that now this person, Jesus, becomes vulnerable to the abandonment of God. A condition which finally fell upon him with all the forces of the darkness of hell as he hangs on the cross. And in the darkness he cries out because of his abandonment. Now, to confirm that this wonderful event when Jesus touches this man and says, I am, be clean, to confirm what it's all about. It's not about healing. It's about restoring a person to enter into the presence of God cleansed because that's the condition necessary for any person to come before God. Jesus tells the man, go to the temple, offer the sacrifices necessary that the law of Moses requires, and the priests there will, will declare you clean. Go to the temple. Enjoy your God. Enjoy him like everyone else. You're clean. You can go to church. You can offer sacrifices. You can stand with your brothers and sisters and you can receive God's blessing. And so he did. He was restored by the mercy of Jesus. He was cleansed in order that he might go in. It's a, it's a really beautiful miracle. I just love reading the story about the Jesus healing the leper early in the gospel narratives. And this... This has so much to teach us in a, in a really impactful way. It has so much to teach us about baptism. In answer 69 of the Heidelberg Catechism, it, it, it had, the Catechism had asked, what does holy baptism signify and seal to us? Or how does it signify and seal to, you, to us that the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross benefits us? And it, it, the answer to the catechism says, just, you know, baptism is a water uh, ceremony. Water is sprinkled, or a person goes into, into, into a pool of water. It's a water rite in which water is, is used to, we are, we, are, we are reminded, water is used in order to wash dirt away from our body. If we didn't have the access to water to wash our bodies, oh, well, this would be a pretty smelly place. <laughs> but, but we have that privilege. We can wash our bodies, and baptism uses that, that action in order to symbolize a spiritual reality. Just as water washes dirt from our body, 
in just in that same way, the blood and spirit of Jesus Christ washes us inwardly, washes my soul of every impurity. That is all my sin. So that now, now that I'm baptized, I'm clean, I can go in. I can meet my God. We need to realize that enjoying the friendship of God is, is not a human right. It's, it's a privilege that's granted to us, and it's granted only to those who have faith in Jesus Christ and who are therefore cleansed by His blood and Spirit. Now, perhaps you're sitting here this evening, you're in enjoying the music, you feel lifted up by the prayer that Matt had offered, you delight to hear about Jesus and it's just, it's so beautiful. But maybe you're not baptized. Jesus cares about these details we might think, you know, I love Jesus, that's enough. But Jesus cares about details. He, he tells this man, it's Jesus that does it. He says, the law requires that you go to the temple, you offer the sacrifice, and you be declared clean. Jesus cares about the details. He, he wants us to follow the prescriptions. He wants our heart. He wants us to love him. But he also wants us to do the things which... Love for him requires of us. The story of the leper is a beautiful story about how important baptism is. To be washed by Jesus to be touched by him and have all our uncleanness taken away from us. To be granted that privilege because you're baptized in the name of Jesus and the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit. To be granted that privilege. Yes, you can come in. This is your home. This is where you belong. With God's people and with your Creator. because of Jesus' blood and spirit. He really wants you. And by touching this man, he, he teaches us he's willing to accept any transfer. Whatever is on you, he's going to transfer it on himself. And he can purify you, taking away everything that prevents you from entering into the place of eternal joy. He did it for this man, and he wants to do it for you. Don't neglect this beautiful gift. If you haven't been baptized, ask for it. Ask the church for it. If you have been baptized, cherish this amazing gift and give thanks daily to God for what you have, cleanness in Jesus. Your Father... He's very vigilant about his presence, and he wants you to be there through Jesus Christ. Amen. We have an opportunity for questions uh, that um, may be sent to... Um, to the phone number, that's, uh, that's my phone number, uh, in, in the uh, liturgy. So, um, okay, I have received one question uh, by text. Other versions of the Bible say Jesus was indignant instead of Jesus had compassion. Those seem to me to have very different meanings. Can you explain that? Yeah, 
Have you ever seen a minister unprepared for a question? <laughs> Sorry, I wished I could answer that question, but I cannot. Yeah. Um, the Greek word splenknos, splenknos, or something like that, uh, refers to the, the, the twisting of his guts. That's the re reaction that he had. Perhaps uh, there is a sense of indignation there, but it seems inappropriate. So I cannot comment on that, on that question. Thanks for that interesting question. I will look into that one day. Is there any other questions that anybody might have um, this evening? Else we will simply walk home with the joy of the gospel. Oh, question. Yeah, thank you. Laura. Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, really in interesting question. That is uh, not a new question. You stand shoulder to shoulder with many in, uh, in the history of the church that have asked this question. In fact, um, uh, no less than uh, Constantine, the, the great uh, emperor of the Roman Empire, uh, he, he avoided baptism until the day of, that he died. He wanted to be baptized as late as possible because of that same conviction that you express, that idea that I want to make sure that after I'm baptized, I do not sin again lest I uh, compromise my possibility of entering into heaven because of that uncleanness that I have brought upon me. Okay, so, um, but okay, when we are baptized, there is that pledge that, when, as it's explained in, um, in the baptismal form, Jesus Christ promises us, you see, the Father is making a beautiful promise, the Son is making a beautiful promise, the Holy Spirit is making beautiful promises. The Father is promising, I'm, I adopt you, you've become part of my family, you've come under my care, and the the, the, uh, the, the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, it will protect you from disqualification. So the blood of Jesus is perpetually cleansing us. It's always cleansing us. We always have access to that, that, that work of Jesus uh, because we are baptized. It's not the once and, and, and never again, it is cleansing which happens to you at your baptism and which remains with you whenever you confess your sin and ask for God's grace. Consequently, uh, we pray daily, frequently, Lord, please forgive me my sins. You have promised me in Jesus Christ at my baptism that you would do so, now please do so again. So it's a, you can make daily appeals to Jesus' blood because you're baptized, you're part of the family. The Father will continue to clothe you with, with the purity of Jesus. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Laura. Appreciate that. I hope that, that answers your question. You get one out of two isn't too bad. could do better. Any other questions this evening? Very well. Thank you for your questions. Uh, may God bless each of us as we celebrate Jesus' blood and, uh, and so on. Okay, I probably did, but I didn't look yet. Go ahead, Donna. Um, so, Jesus is a, is a man, a human being, and the law of God, the Mosaic law, the law of Moses in the Old Testament, applies to all humans, <laughs> and therefore it applies to Jesus. Jesus doesn't get a buy. He doesn't have any special privileges above other people. So, if I touch a 
dead body, you know, I'm thinking, imagine I'm in the Old Testament times. If I touch a dead body, I become unclean by that very fact. If Jesus touches a dead body, why should he not become unclean? Why should he be, have the privilege to touch the dead and not become unclean by it? The, the, the law says he becomes unclean. When Jesus touches a leper, anybody else who does it becomes unclean. If Jesus does, he becomes unclean too. And um, Matthew, uh, Matthew seems to draw specific attention to this exact fact that the uncleanness of the men has been transferred to Jesus just as everybody else's sicknesses and diseases have been transferred to Jesus because Matthew quotes the, the, the promise of Isaiah where uh, it is said he... Um, let me, I want to make sure I get it right. Um, he, he took our diseases and carried our sorrows. So he took our uncleanness as well. Yeah. And consequently, in his status of being unclean, uh, he was separated from his Father in heaven. As he's hanging on the cross, there at last, the, the weight of this falls upon him. Um, and he is abandoned by the Father. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we may be assured that nothing will separate us from God anymore because Jesus has taken it away. Yeah. Thank you again, Donna. We have awesome opportunities for extending the, the grace of God as it's proclaimed in the, in the sermon. May I lead you now in thanksgiving and prayer. Heavenly God and Father, we thank you that among the first miracles that Jesus performed was this act of compassion, this tender connection that Jesus makes with a, a man suffering so pathetically because of uncleanness. And as we consider the pathetic condition of that man, we are taught the pathetic condition in which we find ourselves because we are also incredibly unclean, repulsive because of the sins that occupy our hearts and find expression in our lives. We are touched by Jesus and we're assured of it by, our, by baptism so that we are clean. And there's nothing that will ever separate us from your love. Thank you, O Heavenly Father, that through Jesus we may come to you. Thank you, O Father, that through Jesus we may have an abiding connection with you through the Holy Spirit, that he, he is with us. And we may walk through the, the challenges of the week that lies before us, knowing we are being led, we are being shown the way, we are being reminded, we are being advised, we are being carried by your loving Holy Spirit. Thank you for these blessings. May we not just be the recipients of blessings and celebrate what we have received. May we go and bear much fruit by being a blessing to many. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We now come to the part of our service where we are called to give our gifts, our gifts of thanksgiving, our gifts of time and money. Uh, this month, we are in our fifth Sunday, and that means that it's a special collection. The collection today is for the k and Food Drive. Hopefully, there's a slide up behind me. Uh, you can give electronically using deacons at blessingshamilton.ca. Please indicate the cause your donation is for. There's also a black box on the back wall. Uh, guests are more than welcome to participate, but please remember we don't expect that of you. We're just happy you're here. We will have about a one-minute interlude for this offering. We will uh, think about our gifts then. Can I invite you to, is it my fault? It might be my fault. I dropped it. Bless us day in and day out with an understanding that your son died for us so that we could be clean to worship you. We ask will you guide us and keep us this week. We help us to understand that that cleanliness is also a clarion call to serve you in everything that we do. Lord, as we consider that, we also are mindful that this coming Saturday we get a new king over the the Commonwealth, Lord, we pray, will you bless Charles as he takes up his task as king? Will you continue to guide what he provides for us day in and day out? We ask, Lord, that you would bless us as we leave here. Will you bless us with traveling mercies? Will you bless us with rest? Will you bless the work of our hands? We ask that you do all of this only in your Son, Jesus Christ, blood alone. Amen. 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 Let us then lift up our hearts to receive God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
for coming, everybody, and I hope you have a great week.